Hello students, today I shall be discussing American literature with you and the story that we are going to deal with today is Thank You Ma'am by Langston Hughes. Let me tell you very briefly about Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was born in Joplin, Missouri in the year 1902. He had a very difficult childhood as his parents divorced and he was brought up by his maternal grandfather, grandmother, I'm sorry. He is known as the earliest innovator of, jazz, of the literary art form known as jazz poetry. And he is known as one of the leaders of the Harlem Renaissance. Langston Hughes published in 1921 his first poem known as The Negro Speaks of Rivers, which became his signature piece and was later published in his first collection of poems, The Weary Blues, in 1926. He was associated with the civil rights movement between the years 1942 to 1962. His life and works were enormously influential during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, and he portrayed the lives of the working class blacks as full of struggle, but at the same time, joy, laughter, and music also. His work reflects pride in African-American identity and its diverse culture. My seeking has been to explain and illuminate the Negro condition in America and obliquely that of all humankind, said Hughes. Let us now move to the story, Thank You Ma'am. The story was published in 1958. As you can see in the slide, the setting is probably a place in Harlem. But notice students, not once does Langston Hughes mention that the characters are black. We conclude that they are probably of African American origin because of the language that is spoken throughout the story. It is a dark walkway. The next setting is Mrs. Jones's tiny flat, one bedroom, kitchen, living room, bathroom. The time is late at night because we are told that it is 11 o'clock and the, probably the year is somewhere in the 1950s. The conflict in the story is both external and internal. External because it is between the two characters, that is Roger and Mrs. Jones. Internal conflict is the one that goes on within the conscience of Roger. He wishes to be trusted and he does not wish to betray the loyalty, the trust that Mrs. Jones has placed in him. But at the same time, he is afraid about trusting her. Let us move on to the theme. As you can see in the next slide, it is right versus wrong. Forgiveness, restitution, shame and forgiveness are important because Roger is reprimanded for trying to steal, but he is shown forgiveness and taught an important lesson in human dignity and respect. Who are the characters? Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones is the lady. This woman's reaction to the attempted theft surprises us. In fiction, just in as in real life, what characters say can reveal a lot about them. So pay attention to the dialogues. Who is Roger? Roger, we are told, is a 14 or 15 year old boy. Langston says of him, frail and willow wild. That is, he is probably as weak as a willow tree. Bold enough to steal though. He changes with love and affection shown by Mrs. Jones. Behind the thief, we do believe that there is an innocent child lurking in the shadows. Langston Hughes makes the use of dialects. He wrote the story in dialect. What is dialect, students? A particular form of language 
that is peculiar to a particular area or a particular group of people. This use of dialect, idioms and colloquialisms makes the dialogue between the characters more natural and at the same time realistic. The characters use contractions. What are contractions? Instead of saying, yes, madam, Roger says, yes, mm. Instead of saying, isn't it, they say, ain't. Characters speak in rhythms common to black urban communities. Then there is the use of idioms in the story. Play on idiom, everything but the kitchen sink. We are told that Mrs. Jones is carrying a large purse. Why is she carrying a large purse? Because for her, her purse is not a fashion statement. It has utility value. Her large purse needs to hold her everyday things. That is why she is carrying one. And we are told that it contains everything in it but hammer and nails. I will come to the moral of the story later. First, let us discuss the story in particular. We are told that it is 11 o'clock at night as a large woman carrying a large purse slung over her shoulder walks down a deserted city street. A young boy rushes from behind, tugs at the purse, but unfortunately the strap gives way. He loses his balance and falls down on the pavement. Mrs. Jones, or the woman, as we will know later, the woman, give, kicks him in the butt. Hughes begins by undermining the reader's likely expectations. One might have expected a woman at this hour walking home alone to be frail, vulnerable, but she is not one to be scared. She proves herself more than a match for the thief. And she gets hold of the boy and shakes him till his teeth rattle. She, or rather, we come to know that she has a formidable presence in the story. And on the contrary, the boy seems to be rather weak and frail. Let's continue. Pulling the boy up by his shirt and shaking him, the woman demands that he return her pocketbook. Notice that she does not bend down to pick up the purse. She makes the boy do it. When she asks if he is ashamed, the boy finally speaks. He says that yes, he is ashamed, but at the same time, he denies that his intention was to steal. The woman says that he is lying and then she sees his face and she says that you have a dirty face. Isn't there anyone at home to wash your face for you? And the boy says that he does not have anyone at home. Then she announces her name, Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones. And she says that today she is going to wash his face for him. In this moment, students, the, st the boy does not take responsibility for his theft. He is willing still to lie. But this sets the tone for the growth of the character in the story. He is going to change. Notice again that the woman goes against our expectations. Any other woman may have turned him over to the police or at least given him a good bashing. But she says, no, I'm going to take you home and I am going to wash your face for you. By stepping in, the woman takes the position of a parent or guardian that perhaps the boy does not have. We'll continue. The boy who looks as if he were 14 or 15, I quote, is frail and willow wild in tennis shoes and blue jeans, unquote. The woman declares that if he were her 
son should teach him right from wrong and asks if he is hungry. The boy only wants her to let him go, but she reminds him that his actions put them together in the first place. She had not asked for it. When I get through with you, sir, she says, you are going to remember Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones. The description of the boy's appearance emphasizes his youth. He is not a hardened criminal, but a child who may be a victim of circumstances. When Mrs. Jones reminds the boy that his decision namely to rob her has placed them together, then she is trying to tell him that you have to be responsible for your actions. She knows that there is an innocent child behind the wrong decision that this boy has taken tonight. The young boy continues to struggle uselessly as Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones physically restrains him. She takes him to her room in a boarding house, a small one bedroom space equipped with a kitchenette. She leaves the door open, which allows the boy to hear the laughter and talking of other rumors who live elsewhere in the house. Finally, she asks the boy for his name. It is Roger, as we come to know. She tells him to clean up his face, gives him a clean towel and warm water. Roger asks her, are you going to send me to jail? And Mrs. Jones replies, not with that dirty face, I'm not. She answers back, I quote, not with that face. I would not take you nowhere. Then she suddenly changes the conversation to dinner. She asks, she concludes that, or she supposes that the boy was ready to steal because he must have been hungry. To which Roger replies that no, he did not steal for food. He stole because he wanted a pair of blue suede shoes. The boy's physical struggle against Mrs. Jones and his uncommunicative answers are attempts to keep away, suggesting that he still wants to run away. The very fact that he says that he has stolen because he wanted a pair of blue suede shoes reveals that he has not stolen out of necessity but because he, he aspires to be like others. Mrs. Jones, by telling him that, he, that she will not send him to jail, proves that she is well, willing to change this boy, not to punish him. Roger contemplates escape through the open door. Sitting on her daybed, Mrs. Jones interrupts his runaway thoughts. She asks him, or rather she tells him, I quote, I were young once and I wanted things I could not get, unquote. Roger is silent. Mrs. Jones continues, you thought I was going to say but, didn't you? After admitting she too has done disreputable things, she instructs Roger to comb his hair. This statement, students, is very important. Mrs. Jones does not tell him that she did not make mistakes. She has also made mistakes. She has perhaps done the same things that Roger has. After that, the story shifts its attention to the divisions of Mrs. Jones's room which incorporates some basic kitchen supplies behind a screen. For the first time, Mrs. Jones leaves Roger and her purse on the out of her sight. Roger, however, takes care to remain in a spot where she can see him with the peripheral vision, however, not wanting to be mistrusted. This is a great shift in attitude. Finally, 
Roger does not wish to betray Mrs. Jones's trust. Mrs. Jones then serves him dinner of lima, be lima beans and ham and she does not embarrass Roger by talking or asking about his family. Instead, she tells him about her workplace, the people, the ladies that visit her parlor in a hotel. She does not have much to offer. She is also, she does not have much money and yet she is ready to share whatever little she has, even the 10 cent cake that she has brought with her for her dinner. Roger, before they sat down to dinner, Roger asked her if he could fetch something from the local store. This shows us that Roger is willing to help her. But she says that, no, I don't need milk. If you're okay with the canned milk for your cocoa, then it's fine. And Roger answers that, yes, he's okay with it. They sit down to dinner. The very fact that she serves him dinner at 11 at night proves that she is like or trying to be like a family member to Roger. Finally, Roger, before Roger leaves, she gives him a $10 note. $10 students at that time would have meant a lot of money and a lot of money for Mrs. Jones to have parted with. But by doing that, she wins Roger's trust. She does not lay down any conditions how Roger should spend the money. She could have bought the suede shoes for him instead, but she is not willing to do that. She is trying to instill a sense of responsibility in Roger by giving him the money so that he can spend the money the way he wishes to. Before he leaves, Roger says, thank you. He wants to say more, but he does not find the words to say them. And before he can say anything, he turns around and Mrs. Jones closes the door behind him. And he states that he never sees her again. Coming back to the moral of the story, you can see in the PPT students, for Roger, the moral lesson that he gains is not to steal. Kindness exists in the most unlikely of places. For the readers, not to have prejudices. I quote, I have done things too which I would not tell you, son, unquote, says Mrs. Jones. Sharing. Mrs. Jones shares and gives whatever little she has. You can also discuss the title of the story. The title is a celebration of the act of kindness, reflection of Roger's immense gratitude, the fact that he wanted to say more than thank you, ma'am, reveals that no person has ever shown such kindness to him. And we hope that he has changed over a new leaf. The expected questions or the questions that you can prepare for your examination. Firstly, you can prepare a character sketch of Mrs. Jones or a character sketch of Roger. You can discuss the theme in Thank You, Ma'am. And of course, you can justify the title, Thank You, Ma'am. I hope this lesson has been useful and I wish you the very best for your examinations. Thank you.